with me, if you would, as we get into God's Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your Word, which is the truth. We receive your Word. It's being written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you that we will take hold of it, be doers of it. Thank you that you are establishing us in the fact of covenant relationship and being covenant-minded. Thank you for all that you bring forth this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of covenants. We've talked about what a covenant is. It is a binding agreement between two parties that cannot be broken. The penalty of it is death. We know the fact that it is that which is a blood covenant because the word in the Hebrew means a cutting, implying the shedding of blood. It is a blood covenant that we enter into through receiving Jesus Christ who made the covenant with the Father and was with the man, Christ Jesus. We talked about the fact that a covenant means everything I have is yours and everything that you have is mine. It also is the revelation of God's purposes. It has the responsibilities of each party and also the promises, the blessings that will come, as well as the penalties or the curses that will come if we do not obey the covenant that we have. The word of the covenant is the revelation of the will of the parties. We must remember that God never will break his covenant. He won't alter it. He remembers his covenant, and he will bring it to pass. We talked about the covenants in the Old Testament. We talked about the aspects of the covenant in detail. And we've been talking about the subject, especially here, of how a covenant works. And we've looked at many scriptures. We talked about our inheritance, how our covenant comes into manifestation because of the inheritance in Christ, and how we have responsibilities. We have the conditions that you and I must meet. We've talked about scriptures in the Old Testament, about how the covenant works, and today we're going to talk about more in the New Testament. It's important that you get established in this because our relationship with God is a covenant relationship, and we must understand covenant relationship. Today we're going to be looking at scriptures in the New Testament, and we'll be looking at scriptures where in many cases we'll see, if you do such and such, then I will do such and such. After the if, that's the responsibilities that you and I have. After the then of what he will do, that's God's responsibilities. And we know that God watches over his word to perform it. He swore by himself because he could swear by none greater that he absolutely will perform his word in our life. We're also going to be looking at scriptures that show the subjunctive mood verbs. There are five moods in the Greek, and the subjunctive mood is very important because the mood of this verb shows the fact that something is conditional upon conditions being met. It expresses things that are not fact, but are contrary to fact, that will be fact if the conditions are met. In fact, all of the prophecy scriptures are all in the subjunctive mood when it talks about things that might be fulfilled because they were given, but then they were all, of course, conditional upon being fulfilled. And of course, God is the one who's fulfilled these promises in our life. We see in Hebrews 8, 6 now that in the New Testament it says that he, we now have a better, Jesus has a better ministry by much he's the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. We are in a better covenant, the new covenant. We do not follow the law of the old covenant, we follow the law of the new covenant. And we are to understand our covenant responsibilities as well as the promises that he will bring forth. We're going to look at many scriptures in the New Testament beginning in Matthew and we'll be going through that as we're looking at our covenant responsibilities and promises. In Matthew chapter 4, we see in verse 19, and as we look at these scriptures, think covenant. Think covenant relationship and understand what these scriptures are really saying. They're not just making statements. They're actually covenant declarations. Matthew 4, 19, he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What's our part? Follow him. If you and I will follow him, then what's God's part? He says, I will make you fishers of men. That means if we're truly following the Lord, we're going to be made a fisher of men, reaching out to see people come to the Lord, to be born again, calling them to repentance, ministering to needs in people's lives. We're going to be fishers of men. That's what God will produce. That means if we're not being a fisher of men, are we really following him? If we're following him, God will make us, as he says, fishers of men. In Matthew chapter 5, when you think of this from a covenant responsibility and from covenant promises, 
from a covenant relationship, you realize if I will do what God says and obey Him, I'm going to follow Him in all His ways, then He will bring these promises to pass. Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So persecuted they the prophets which were before you. What is our responsibility here? Well, first of all, we are the ones who people are going to revile us, persecute us, say things against us falsely. You and I are to rejoice and be exceeding glad, not be retaliatory, not be upset, not get down, discouraged, not have an anger attitude against them. No. You rejoice, you be exceeding glad when they persecute you. Do not let it phase you. And what is going to be your reward if you do this? He says you're going to be blessed, as he says in verse 10 and also in verse 11. And he says here that great is your reward in heaven. We want to see great reward in heaven. We want to be blessed right now and in, in the life to come. That's because we learn to deal with persecution. As you preach the gospel and people will persecute you, come against you. Rejoice. Be exceeding glad. Don't let yourself react in the flesh. Otherwise, you'll lose your reward. In verse 29, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. That's quite a statement. He says that here in the next one, If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and that not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now this is in the context in verse 28 where he said, Whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. The Bible says that the people that are fornicators and adulterers, they don't, go to the, they don't enter into the kingdom. They end up in the lake of fires, the Bible says in Revelation. And then this is what he's saying after that. How could we get in this position? if our eye offends us, or if it puts a stumbling block before us. Remember, the Bible talks about eyes of adultery. You're going to have eyes of adultery. Remember, it's not just committing the act. It's looking on someone with lust in your heart. And how's it going to happen? Through the eyes. Or, if your hand offends you, it causes you to stumble in some way, that you get involved in actually the act, whether it's with your eyes or whether it's the act, is what this is talking about. What's going to happen? It's going to send you down into hell. So what does God say? He wants us, of course, to deal with it. Now, should we cut out, get rid of our eye or get rid of our hand? No, that's not the answer. The real answer is we should repent and watch that we do not allow ourselves to have eyes of adultery or ever get involved in it. But notice, our job is that we must do what he says and not let our member cause us to stumble. These are your members your hands, your eyes, whatever you remember you might have. Don't let it cause you to stumble and sin. If not, you could pay a tremendous penalty, as in this case, end up in hell. See, the scriptures not only show us the blessings that will come from the covenant, but they also, remember, show the penalties, because it's the vengeance of the covenant. There are penalties that will come. And the penalty in this case is a terrible penalty of being cast into hell if we do not watch what we yield our members unto. In verse 44, he says, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute. That's our responsibilities. These are covenant statements. You're responsible to love every person and to bless them and do good, pray for them, regardless of what they do to you. That you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. Notice, being children of the Father, that means the fact that God considers you one of his children if you meet his conditions of doing what he says. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the ju unjust. If you love those that love you, what reward have you? Otherwise, you don't have any reward. It says even the publicans or the sinners the same. It's easy to love somebody that loves you. You get no reward for that. That's just what everybody will do. If you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. You should be greeting every person. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. That'll be the result. You see, when we do what He says, then we'll be the children of the Father, and we will be perfect as He is perfect, because He wants us to go on into perfection. 
and be like our Heavenly Father, praise God. We even see over in Luke, with somewhat parallel to this, in Luke chapter 6, verse 32. These are all covenant statements. If you love them that love you, what thank have you? The word thank actually is the word charis, which means grace. What grace or what favor have you, in reality, is what it really says. As Young corrects the error, it really means grace. What favor have you? Sinners also love those that love them. If you want to have favor from God, you're going to have to love those that will not love you. You don't get favor from God just because you do what they do back unto you. If you do good to them that do good to you, what favor again? Caris again. Sinners also do the very same. If you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what grace have you? Otherwise, if they can pay you back, fine. If they don't, don't make it bother you. What hope, you know, if they pay you, so what? For sinners, lend to sinners and receive as much again. Love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, not expecting anything again. Otherwise, remember, when you give someone who has lack or poor or poverty or something, you're lending to the Lord, and God's going to give it back unto you. And he says, what's going to be your reward when you do this? Your reward shall be great. And you should be the children of the highest, for he's kind unto the thankful and to the evil. We want to have great reward. Those are the promises that will come, the covenant promises, if we meet the conditions and do the things that he tells us to do. <coughs> Over in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. He says in verse 2. Matthew, that is, excuse me. We're in the wrong one. Matthew chapter 6, over in verse 2. He says, When thou doest thine alms, which would be giving it to the poor, ministering to people, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. There's no reward if you're doing things to be seen of men, is what it's talking about. When thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Otherwise, again, you're not doing it in order to be seen of men or to impress them. Let thy alms be in secret. The Father would see it in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. What's going to happen if you do things with the right motivation? This is talking about motivation. You're going to be rewarded openly by the Lord. The same is true when you pray. It talks about the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues. So they want to be seen of men. See, that's the motivation that it's talking about. If our motivation is not unto the Lord in anything we do, we're not going to get a reward. Remember, we don't do things unto men. We do everything unto the Lord in all that we do. It says they have their reward. When you pray, enter in the closet. When you shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret. The Father see it in secret, shall reward thee openly. God will reward you. We see down in verse 16, talking about fasting. When you fast, don't be like the hypocrites of a sad countenance. They disfigure their fa faces. They may appear unto men to fast. They want someone to see, oh, look at this person. They're fasting. And they're going through this, uh, they're appearing unto men. They want their, everybody to see and look up to them. They want honor from men. You can tell who they're doing it unto. When you fast, anoint thine head, wash thy face. So you don't, you just look normal. You don't appear unto men to fast. But you're doing it unto the Father in secret. And he is going to reward you openly. Again, that shows everything that we do with our motivation. Always do it unto the Lord and then God will reward you and bless you if you will be obedient to Him. Back in verse 14, we see another covenant statement. If, that's our part, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. We've got to forgive, regardless of what anybody has done to us. If you don't forgive, then God can't perform His word, can He? You actually hinder Him and limit Him. Our Father will forgive us. But He goes on and He says, if you will not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What is this? This is a covenant statement. Because when you do your part, God will do His part. But if you don't do your part, God cannot do His part. We hinder Him from being able to forgive us. That's why it's mandatory that you forgive a person their trespasses or sins against you. Never hold grudges. Never hold on to any bitterness or evil attitudes against another person of unforgiveness. You always choose to forgive. It is not a, a feeling. It's a decision at the point of your will and being obedient to God regardless of what they've done, done. They might have done some very evil things to you, but you must forgive that person. It is mandatory. Or, 
It's going to affect you and your covenant relationship with God, and you won't be forgiven, and you'll be abiding in your sins. Matthew 6, 22. If the light, of the, the light of the body is the eye, if, therefore, there's the condition, thine eye be single, what's our eye to be single upon? The Word of God. Thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, because you've let some evil come in, which would be things that are sinful, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. It takes an effect upon you. If, therefore, the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? That's why we've got to guard ourselves from areas of sin. We can't just think sin's no big deal. Oh, no. When we sin, that's darkness. It's coming in, and it's contaminating that which is in you. We even see over in Luke, parallel to this, Luke chapter 11, and <coughs> verse 34, same thing, light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when the eye is single, the whole body is full of light. When the eye is evil, the whole body also is full of darkness. Take therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If the whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the light bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. Having no part dark, what does that tell you? We can't have a little bit of light and a little bit of darkness. We can't have a little bit of sin and a little bit of righteousness. We can't have some things that are of God and some things that are not of God. No, that's contaminating to us. Instead, we want to get all the darkness out. That means that we want to deal with all sin. We want to crucify the flesh, turn away from everything that's not of God. We want to cast out all the spirits, their spirits, that bring darkness and destruction. Because we want ourselves full of light, full of the things of God. These are all covenant statements. You see our part and you see God's part. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Whose part is that? Ours. What's the kingdom? The rule and the reign of God. God wants you to seek how the rule and the reign of God works. And his righteousness, which is his way of righteousness. So we do righteousness, so we will be righteous before him. And then what's going to happen? All these things shall be added unto you. That's all the things that you have need of. Because he's talking about here what will drink, what will be clothed, you know, their needs being met in their life, in the context. If you will seek the kingdom, the rule and reign of God, you'll learn how to rule and reign over the devil who tries to come and steal from you. And if you walk in righteousness, being a doer of the word of righteousness, you're going to see God perform his word and bring all your rights and privileges and promises come to pass. Then everything will be added unto you. But we have to meet our part, and then God will meet his part. Over Matthew 7. Verse 7, ask and it shall be given you. The word ask is a word iteo. Remember that there are different words for ask in the Greek. And this is a word which is important to understand. If you notice, it's number 154. This particular word from the Lightning Bible program, which has Strong's Concordance inside of it, tells us what this word really means. Number 154 means a demand of something due. What you are doing in the New Testament when you pray, is you are making a demand of something do you. What is do us? All the promises of God. How do we make a demand of what's do us? We pray the word, which is the promise. We pray the scriptures. And what happens? You pray the scriptures and you bring that to him that's been already given to you. All the promises have already been given to you. That's your part. Now, what's God going to do? He has to perform that because he's already covenanted with you that he will perform his word. That's why it says, it shall be given you. It's going to come to pass. Not maybe it'll be given you. It shall be given you. If you make a demand of what's due you, you pray the word of God, God will bring it to pass. Seek, and you shall find. What's your job? You've got to seek. We've got to seek the scriptures, seek the truth, seek the way of the Lord, seek the things he tells us to seek after, and then you're going to find it. Knock, and it shall be opened. God will open up doors. He'll open up things for you but you are going to have to seek after the way of the Lord and, and knock and it shall be opened unto you. We even see down in verse 11 again, he says, If you then be an evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things? What's all the good things? All the promises that belong to us. To who? Those who I tell make a demand of what's due them. God wants you to bring forth his word and know that he will perform his promises. Praying your problem, will that cause God to respond and bring forth the good things? No, because 
His covenant is telling you what His Word is. And when you pray the Word, then God performs His Word because He watches over to perform it in our life. That's why, as we've talked about, an example in the prayer for a job, that we're praying scripture after scripture after scripture. And what is happening? God is performing all those scriptures in your life as you're praying them, and then you see the results, the fruit of it, that God is bringing forth jobs for those people that have been praying. We see another scripture over in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Whose job is that? You and me. We have to enter in at the straight gate. What's a straight great gate? It's actually the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go thereat. That's not a few. That means a lot of people. Many. That's the, that's the majority are going the wrong way. <laughs> They're walking the, the wide gate, the broad way, whatever way they want to walk, essentially. And what's it doing? It's leading them to the path of destruction. Because straight or narrow is the gate. And the word narrow, you say, what's this? I thought the other, other word would mean narrow, but this word narrow here actually means pressed. It is a Greek word, phlebo, from which we get our word thlipsis, which means pressure or pressed. As Young's brings out the correct rendering of this word, compressed or pressed is the way. Narrow is the gate, and compressed is the, or pressed is the way that leads to light. Because as you walk the narrow way, what's going to happen? The devil's going to come against you, and he's going to bring pressure against you. And he will try to press you. You're going to have to walk that walk and resist him and stay on that path. And what does that do? It leads to life. And few there be that find it. What does that tell us? Well, if we enter in the, our part is entering in at the straight gate, the narrow way, walk in the narrow way. What's the result? We're going to see life. We're going to see God's light. But what happens if we try to go the broad way, the wide way, doing whatever we want to do? What's the result of that? It leads to destruction. Essentially, that's telling you the pro, the, uh, God's part, and then the blessing will come if we do what he says. At the same time, it's telling you the penalty. It's a covenant statement. If you don't walk that way, but you walk a broad, narrow way, then you're going to get the penalty, which is destruction. Again, it's important for you to think of the Word of God from a covenant standpoint, because it is a covenant, and it's all revealing the ways of a covenant relationship. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. That's showing us our part, isn't it? We're the ones that are supposed to hear. And the word hear, by the way, happens to be in the present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. Those who are hearing and continuing to hear and doing, this is also in the present tense, doing and continuing to do, present tense, his word, I'll like him to a wise man who build his house upon a rock. That's going to be the result. We build our house on a rock. The rain descended, floods came, winds blew. That's a type of the enemy, Satan, coming against you to try to bring destruction against you and beat upon that house. You are the house of God. And it fell not, for it was founded, or had the foundation had been laid upon a rock. That shows you something. If you will be a hearer and a doer of the word, then God will come on the scene and you will not be affected by the attacks of the enemy. And you will have built your foundation, laid that foundation on a rock, and your house will not fall. That means you're going to be able to stand any of the attacks against the enemy. That's the person who's a hearer and a doer of the word. Everyone who heareth these sayings of mine, same thing, present tense, he's continually hearing, this means, how about the guy that's not hearing anything? Well, he's in trouble for sure. But the guy's hearing and continuing to hear his word, and doeth them not. This word is also in the present tense. That means he's only been hearing the word, but he hasn't been applying it in his life. He hasn't been doing it. What happens to him? He's likened to a foolish man. He built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, floods came, winds blew, same attacks of the enemy. Beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. What does that tell you? That shows you the penalty. If you don't do the word that you hear consistently, your house is not going to stand against the attacks of the enemy. And you're going to have a fall. You're going to have a great fall. It's going to be a continuous fall, because when it talks about this particular word, this is actually in the imperfect tense, 
which in the Greek means continuous ongoing action. In the past, it was continually happening, showing this fall will be great. And it's going to be a continuous fall that occurs. As Young's really brings out the true wording of it from the Greek standpoint, its fall was continually great, is what that means. Again, this is a covenant statement. It's not just a statement throwing out words. We're trying to get you to see that God's word is a covenant, and this word of the covenant shows our responsibility and God's responsibility. This is how you can know what God will do. It's not like, well, I sure hope he performs it. No, you know what God will do because these are co covenant statements. So your job is to hear the word continually and do it continually. You will build that house on a rock and the enemy will not be able to have effect against you. Over in Matthew chapter 9. But again, we see the, con the opposite because, again, it's a covenant showing the penalties if you don't hear and do the word. Matthew 9, 38. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest. When it talks about this word send forth here, first of all, they don't translate it the best in the King James. He will send forth sounds like he will automatically do it. Well, that he's in the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood means that which is conditional upon conditions being met. Therefore, what it's saying is, as Young's brings it out, that as you pray the Lord of the harvest that he may, or might more literally, might put forth the laborers or the workmen to the harvest. What does that mean? It's conditional because the subjunctive mood expresses things that are conditional. Is God going to send forth the laborers just because the laborers need to go out there? No, unless somebody meets the conditions. And who's the one who meets the conditions? You and I do. You and I are the ones who are to pray the Lord of the harvest. We're to pray for him to send forth the laborers. If you and I do it and meet the conditions, then they'll be sent out. That's why you hear us praying this all the time. You should be doing the same thing. Praying daily, continually, that the Lord is sending forth the laborers out into the harvest field. If you will pray it, he will do it. And see, when we pray this, we're not saying, well, I sure hope God does it. No, this is a covenant statement. If you pray it, it'll get done for sure. See, when you understand covenant, you're going to have faith in everything that you do. You aren't going to do anything of the word of God and just wondering, wavering, hoping maybe it'll work out. You're going to know what God will do. See, you have covenant relationship with God, and that is of paramount importance. We see over in Matthew chapter 10, verse 33, Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. That's quite a statement. That doesn't seem like it'd be fair. Well, it's fair because it's a covenant relationship. Well, however you treat God, God is how he's going to treat you. That's the way a covenant works. You deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before the Father. This is Jesus doing the speaking. <coughs> Talking about denying him. Well, who's he? His word. If you deny his word, what's going to happen? You are going to be denied before the Father. And that is important to realize. We even see something similar over in Mark. In Mark, in chapter 8, verse 38. We've got to stand up for the word, see. He goes on and he says, Mark 8, 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, how would we be ashamed of him if we won't stand up for the truth and speak forth the word of God, if we compromise the word of God, or we won't witness in the face of persecution or whatever someone might think to be against us or whatever. No, we cannot be ashamed of him. We can't be ashamed of his words. It says, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with his holy angels. If we're ashamed of him, he's going to be ashamed of us. We can't be ashamed of him. We must be ready to stand on his word, speak his word, witness about his word, do what his word says, regardless of what anybody thinks. It is very important. Otherwise, we're going to be denied before the Lord. That's a covenant statement. Matthew chapter 11, down here in verse 6. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. The word offended means to, get, to be, have a stumbling block or if something causes you to stumble. You'll be blessed if you're not stum have a stumbling that comes at you. And that's what God wants us to realize. And when we talk here 
about someone not being offended here. This is talking about, again, someone who would be caused to stumble in some way, as Young's brings out a real good rendering of this. And this is in the subjunctive mood, which again means conditional. And notice it's the passive voice. The passive voice means somebody else is doing this to you. Who would cause us to stumble? It's not God, it's the devil. This is talking about the devil causing you to stumble against the word of God. If you won't stumble, you'll be blessed. That means God wants you to resist the enemy's temptations. When the enemy tempts you, and he would try to get you to stumble and turn away from the word of God, what's going to happen? You give place to him, you're not going to be blessed. We've got to be ready to resist temptation every time it comes. You resist the temptation with what? The word of God, so that you walk in line with the word. If he causes you to stum be stumbled, then you will not be blessed. In Matthew chapter 12, we see another covenant statement in verse 28. Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, there's the if, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. What's the kingdom of God? The rule and the reign of God, His dominion. You want the rule and the reign of God to come into manifestation in your life? What's your part? Jesus said, my part was, He says, to cast out the demons. Then what's going to happen? Then God's going to perform that, and the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God is going to come into manifestation. Therefore, what's our responsibility? cast out the demons. What's God's responsibility? To bring his rule and reign into manifestation to destroy the works of the enemies. That's why we should be casting out the demons. If you won't cast the demons, don't expect that the kingdom is going to come into manifestation in your life. It won't. This is a covenant statement before the Lord. It goes on in verse 29, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house? Who's the strong man? It's Satan. And spoil is good. What's his house? It's the demonic spirits that are in a person that have come in from inheritance, our own sins, or victimization. Except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. What has to happen first? Somebody's got to bind the strong man. Who's that? You and I. We're going to bind Satan. We're going to tie him up. And then we're going to spoil his house to cast out those spirits. And what's going to happen? God's power is going to go into operation and all of the works of the enemy are going to be destroyed in your life because the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God will come in the past, come in the manifestation. So this is why we've got to bind Satan first. You tie him up, then you begin to cast him out and God then will perform his word to destroy the works of the enemy in our life. We see in verse 36, he says, Every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. That's quite a statement. Now, why is that? Because you have a covenant with God. It's not because God's going to sit there and just say, well, you spoke some wrong words, so we're going to penalize you, or we're going to, you know, we're going to get after you because of that. It has nothing to do, it all has to do with covenant. This is a covenant statement. Every idle word, idle means that which is not producing. It shows here like lazy or free from labor, or that which is not being performing something. But in reality, what this really means, this word, when you look it up in some of the concordance, it means something that's unprofitable or worthless or not performing or not working. Something that's unprofitable or worthless. Otherwise, you've spoken some words that are not working on God's behalf or for your, even for your benefit. Every worthless, unprofitable word that you speak, you're going to give account in the day of judgment. That's quite a statement. You know, a lot of people say, well, I thought if I was forgiven of all my sins, there'd be no more problems. You know, everything would be fine. Not the way it works in a covenant. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive, he's going to carry off, he's going to get this, the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, that's if we speak wrong words. That's something we've done in our body. We spoke words or things we might do, actions. That's why our words are so important. Watch the words you speak. Be sure you're only speaking things that are in line with the Word of God because we are going to be judged. Now, if we go back over to Matthew in chapter 12, we see what this next statement that he makes, which is, again, a declaration of the blessings that will come, but also the negative effect. He says here, we're going to give account in the day of judgment. By thy words, you're going to be justified or rendered righteous, declared righteous. Or by thy word, you're going to be condemned or be given judgment. That tells us something. 
Again, that's a covenant statement. You speak right words, you're going to be declared righteous before the Lord. You're going to be blessed. You're going to get a reward. You speak wrong words contrary to His word, you're going to be judged. And you're going to get what you have said out of your, in, from your body, whether it was good or whether it was bad. And that really gets a hold of us. When you get a hold of that, you see, I better watch the words that I'm speaking. I want to be sure that I'm only speaking things that are going to glorify the Lord. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. These are covenant statements. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother, sister, and mother. That would be family. What's our part? Do the will of the Father. What's God's part? Now he says you're a part of the family. He will make you a part of the family. We know this back from the whole context is when he said, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. Well, Jesus, he says, Who's my mother and who are my brethren? Stretch forth his hand toward his disciples. He said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Your mother and your brethren are not your earthly family, from Jesus' perspective. Your mother and brethren are those who are doing the will of the Father. Those are the ones that are family. We have a spiritual family, and that's, remember, we're born from above. We're not from this earth any longer. Therefore, we must realize that as you and I do the will of the Father, we are going to be a part of the family of God, praise God. In Matthew chapter 13, these are all covenant statements, see. If we don't do the things that he says, then are we a part of the family? Not according to the covenant. Matthew 13, 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, I mean, it's gotten thick, it's gotten dull. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, should understand with their heart, should be converted, and I should heal them. All these statements should see, uh, and should, uh, with their ears as well, hear, should understand, should be converted. They're all in the subjunctive mood, every single one of them. All these ones in the subjunctive mood means that these are all conditions. I'll just show you one of them. Take the time to do it of all of them. That means the fact that these are all conditions, that we must be able to see with our eyes, spiritual eyes, hear with our spiritual ears, have a true understanding from our heart which comes if we meet the conditions, and we're going to be converted. And then he says, I should heal them. Again, this shows the fact that it should heal them, not that he... It's just going to happen just because we want it. it. No, it's because we've met the conditions. Subjunctive mood. We're going to meet the conditions. What are the conditions? We've got to see with our eyes the Word of God. We've got to hear so that we hear the truth. We've got to gain spiritual understanding of His ways so that we walk in it. And we obviously must be converted, which means to turn away from, to turn to Him and turn away from that which is not of Him. And then we'll be in a position where God can bring forth His healing. He just doesn't do it automatically just because you want him to heal you. It's because you've come in line with his word and are doing what his word says. These, again, are all covenant statements. Over in Matthew chapter 14, down here in verse 36, he besought them that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched were perf made perfectly whole. We see other places where it talk talks about touching his garment, touching the hem of his garment. Now, when it talks about this touch, this interest, interesting word, this particular word, touch, it doesn't mean just like, well, I just touched them, that's all. It doesn't mean that. It's a word which means to fasten to, to adhere to, to cling to, that you've grabbed hold of, you're holding on to this, which means you're continuing in something. And what's he talking about? He's talking about touching the hem of his garment. What was about the hem of the garment? The hem of the garment here is talking about how the Jews had a little tassel or a little appendage that would hang down from the edge of their garments, it says. And it was to remind them of the law, is what, the, what it was all about. It would remind them of the word. And so in touching the hem of his garment, what were they doing? They're reminding him of his word. And they're touching him, fastening, taking hold, adhering, clinging to his word essentially. What do we do if we're going to get healed? We're going to take hold of His Word. This isn't talking about, oh, I touched Him, that should happen. It's talking about taking hold of His Word, which is the revelation of it. And if you adhere to it, you cling to it, you hold fast to this, that means you're going to be doing it. You're going to be walking in it. 
You're going to be standing steadfast. You're going to be speaking it. You're going to be doing what he says. You're going to not be denied. You're going to carry out the word of God. And you're going to keep speaking that and speaking that into being, praying the word. And what's going to happen? God is going to bring forth healing in your life. It's a covenant statement, though. You and I must take hold of the Word of God and do what He says, adhere to it, cling to it. The promises of God stand on it, speak it into being, pray it. And then what do we know? We know what God will do. It's a covenant statement. We're not like, I hope maybe God will do it. No, they were made perfectly whole. You see this happen time after time, that the people were made whole, praise God. Now, in Matthew chapter 15, we see another covenant statement. He says, let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. That means if someone you're following after or listening to is blind, then you're going to end up being blind. And what's going to happen? Both are going to fall in the ditch. That means we can't, we can't say, well, so-and-so told me to do this, you know, doesn't matter. You're responsible. That's why every one of us have to check out the Word to be sure the things are right. If we don't check out the Word to see if things are so, we can't say, well, so-and-so taught me this or told me this. That's not going to hold water. We're end, going to end up both falling, falling in the ditch. Therefore, what does God want us to do? He wants us to examine the Scriptures on everything. Be sure you're not listening to things that are contrary to the Word. Remember this principle over in Acts 17:11. The ones at Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and they received the word with all readiness of mind. They searched the scriptures daily, whether the things were so. So they weren't walking in a way that's contrary to the word. That's why, again, that's a covenant statement, though. You know, it's, you say, well, God certainly should understand. No, he understands covenant. He understands the word. And I'm sorry, he's going to do the word. You know, if you're, if you're blind and you're following someone's blind, you're, you're going to end up following the ditch. That's... That's going to be the penalty for it because we didn't carry out his word. Also, we see that when people would come to Jesus, they'd come to him appealing to the covenant. That's why, how they came. See, they were covenant-minded back then. They understood covenant. Matthew 15, 22, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried to him, saying, Have mercy me on, on me, O Lord, thou son of David. She wasn't even a Jew, and yet she was appealing to the covenant. She'd heard about it, and she knew about it. She'd investigated this. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Son of David, that's talking about the Davidic covenant. What was the covenant of David? Of the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God, which would bring what? The deliverance from the devil. Remember, Jesus said, if I cast out devils, the kingdom has come unto you. And so she's calling, I want the kingdom to come to me. I want the devil cast out of the daughter. I want you to perform the covenant, essentially is what she's saying. And he's just you know, wanting him to do this. Well, he said, he answered her not a word. Why? Because he's doing things according to the covenant. Who did Jesus come to? Did he come to those people outside of the covenant? No. He came to those who were inside the covenant, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Disciples came. He didn't even answer a word. Disciples came, besought it, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. He answered and said, I'm not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I've only come to those in covenant relationship. He answered and said, I'm not, and, and he goes on the next verse and says, she came in and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She wasn't going to be, didn't want, didn't want to be denied because she knew something. She understood something, which we'll see in a moment. He answered and said, it's not meat to take the children's bread. He's essentially saying, the deliverance that you seek for belongs to the children. Who are the children? The ones that have covenant relationship with him, that belong to it, have, it's a right for them and cast it to the dogs. Who are the dogs? Those that aren't in covenant relationship. She says, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. In other words, yeah, I understand they're eating first, but the crumbs are going to come down to me, and the, the dogs are eating of it, so therefore I'm going to eat of it, and I know I'm going to eat of it later. Because of that statement, Jesus said, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And the daughter was made whole from that very hour. We even see something else. It's all covenant, see? Over in Mark, it's in chapter 7. Something that adds to this. Because here's the one that came and fell at the feet of Jesus. This is the woman who's a Greek. Sought the, him to cast forth the devil out of the daughter. Notice what Jesus said. You have to look at this one to understand. He said, let the children first 
be filled. He didn't say let the children only be filled. The other place it says it was the children's bread. But this one, you have to look at all those together to see the full context of what was being said. Let the children first. What's that mean? First in time or place. These ones get first. Why? Because they have a covenant now. And what was that implying? If they're first, that means somebody's going to be second. That means the covenant's coming to you later, Greek person that doesn't have a covenant now. And she caught hold of that. For it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And of course, that's why she said, the dogs eat the, the table under the, eat the children's crumbs. For this saying, the devil was gone forth. She was appealing to covenant and the fact that, yes, I understand that the covenant, she said, truth, Lord, the covenant is not for me now. But I see the covenant's coming to me later. That was great faith. And because of that, he cast forth the, do the devil out of her. Praise God. Again, we're talking about covenant relationship and how important this is for you to understand. Because everything you see in the Word of God, it's all based on covenant. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, this is a verse we talked about in the past, but you haven't heard this. It's important to unravel this. First of all, the word heaven used three times in this verse, is translated singular in the King James. It is a mistake. In the Greek, it is heavens. It is plural in every case. That changes the whole meaning. It's not talking about heaven where God is. It's talking about the heavens where the evil spirits are. That's a whole different point. You can see the fact that it's heavens. You may not know Greek, but this is the word heaven. And notice that it's in the plural. The SCM is Scriveners, which is the Greek translation from the King James. Here's the second one, heavens. It's the masculine plural, the dative. And then here's the third one, down here, which is the dative masculine plural. Every case is plural. Why didn't they translate it plural? Who knows? None of the modern translations, only the literal ones, have translated it correctly. And it changes the whole meaning. I will give unto the keys, the means of access to the kingdom of the heavens. That's the rule and the reign of the heavens. That means he's saying something to them. You are going to get keys so that you can do something to bring forth the rule and the reign of the heavens. Whatsoever you shall bind, that's our part, isn't it? Our job on earth where we are, that's where we are, shall be, that's where the main verb stops, Bow, having been bound in heaven. I'll show you this for you who have never seen this. The word be is the main verb, which is the indicative mood. The main verb is a mood of reality and the indicative mood. The word bound is not the main verb. It is a participle, which is like a verbal adjective, which is describing something, something in addition. Having, this is in the perfect tense, literally it would be translated as Young brings this out, great translation. Whatsoever thou mayest bind upon earth shall be having been bound, that's the translation correctly of a participle, perfect participle, in the heavens. Now there's another thing you want to see. When it talks about this whatsoever thou shalt, shalt bound, again you kind of miss this a little bit because this happens to be in the subjunctive mood. Meaning it's conditional upon you doing it. It's not going to get done unless you do it. you got to meet the condition, which is what? you got to do the binding. You are responsible to do the binding. If you will meet the conditions of binding the, the principalities, the powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavens, it shall be. That is a covenant statement of what God will do. His responsibility is, it shall be. <coughs> Having been bound in the heavens. Now, when it says having been bound in the heavens, let's go back to this. We mentioned that this is a participle. Perfect tense means it's, it, it will be accomplished. A past tense, it will have been accomplished. By who? Not by the person because it's a passive voice. It means it's going to be accomplished by God. How does God do things? Through angels that hearken to the voice of his word. So who's going to confront all the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies? The warring angels of God are going to confront them and they are going to tie them up 
and deal with them successfully. What does this tell you? You and I can affect what goes on in the heavens. But we got a responsibility. It's a covenant statement. If you will bind on earth and know that it shall be, you can't be doubting. Having been bound in the heavens because of the angels that have gone forth to do this, you're going to see changes come in the realm of the Spirit. The church needs to understand this verse. Start to bind all these spirits to stop their works. When you bind something, you tie it up. You tie it up and stop it. The opposite is said, whatsoever thou shalt loose. It's the same thing. It's in the subjunctive. Loose means to untie, which means I can bind the spirits in the heavenlies to stop their works. They aren't working anymore. Now, where they've already had a place bound already, let's say this nation, which has got a lot of spirits in the heavenlies that are, have control over our government, over a lot of things that are going on. We loose and untie its hold from our government. We untie it. That's what we're doing in the realm of the spirit because the battle is a spiritual battle against spiritual enemies that our Satan is working through that are influencing the affairs of life. Therefore, this is a powerful scripture. I've given you the keys, the means of access to the rule and the reign of the heavens. If you will meet the conditions and bind these devils, you got to bind them. Remember, who is our warfare against? You know, praise God, we want to be interested certainly in what's going on in our nation and all these things in the natural and politically and all this. But where's the real battle got to be won? In the spirit. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against the spiritual wickedness in the high places. Who are they? Those are all the evil spirits serving Satan. They're operating in highly organized control, dominating the affairs of men, dominating governments, dominating what's going on because of not walking in the ways of the Word of God. Therefore, you and I have a responsibility. Now, it means conversely, if you do not bind the spirits in the heavens, they aren't going to get bound and they're going to keep on working. If you do not loose and untie their hold, you're not going to stop their working. You're not going to eliminate what they're doing. They're going to keep on having dominion over a particular place and influencing it. This is why you and I must understand covenant and also our covenant responsibilities. Remember, you and I have a responsibility to do this. This is not just a, a nice suggestion. These are covenant responsibilities that you and I have that God expects you and I to do so that then God can perform His Word and He will perform it. If all the Christians understood this and we started doing this, we would see tremendous changes come forth in this nation and wherever we might be. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto His disciples, If any man will, that's the main verb, to come, literally is what it says, as Young's brings forth, to come after me. So, that's what we want. We want to come after him. Now he gives us the responsibilities. You've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross. Crucify the flesh. You've got to follow him. So what are our responsibilities? You've got to deny yourself. Can you ever come after Jesus successfully if you won't deny yourself? Nope. It'll never happen. You're just trying to do it your own way. Can we ever come successfully after him if we don't take up our cross daily and, and crucify the flesh? No, because we're trying to do it in the flesh. You can never do it successfully in the flesh. Can we ever come successfully after him if we don't follow him? How do we follow him? We follow his word. Again, this shows us exactly what we do so that God will bring forth what he wants. Whosoever will save his life, this is the suke. The word suke means soul below. <coughs> it's the word suke down here. More normally translated soul, which is what the word really means, as you saw down there. Whosoever will save his soul life, he's going to destroy it. What does that mean? Remember what it was just talking about? It's talking about denying yourself, taking up your cross, which is to crucify the flesh, so otherwise you're not yielding to the flesh or the body anymore, and following him. And now it's talking about in the soul realm. If you try to save your soul realm directed life is what it's talking about, you're going to end up losing it and destroying it. Why? Because you're trying to walk according to your own mind, your own emotions, your own will, your own thoughts, your own reasoning, your own feelings, which is all of the soul. Is that of the Lord? No. You've got to walk in the Spirit according to the Word. But whosoever will lose or destroy 
his soul realm life, talking about directed by it, for my sakes, he's going to find it. Because what's going to happen? You're going to see God's life be manifest through his word as you walk in the spirit that brings forth the life of God in you in all aspects, including the area of your soul. What man is a prophet? If he gains the whole world and loses, this is a different word, it means to damage, do damage and suffer loss to his own soul. This is why. You cannot compromise anything. You can't compromise principles in order to gain something and profit something. That's what the world does. If you, what does a man profit if he gains the whole world? Oh, I did all these things, I got all this money, I got all these things. And you, you would damage or destroy your soul. Why would you damage and destroy your soul? Because you didn't do things according to God's ways. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He's nothing. He's going to be in trouble. And the Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angel, and he's going to reward every man according to his works. Your works got to be works of the Spirit in order to be rewarded. You see, we've got to understand covenant statements. We'll jump ahead into 1 Corinthians 3. If any man's work, we'll, we'll go back a verse. <coughs> it says, every man shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Every man's work, all the things that you've been doing, all your deeds, all your actions, are going to be tried by fire. If any man's work abide, that means it's, it's okay. There wasn't anything bad about it. It was the things of the Lord, which he's built thereupon. He gets a reward. Praise God. If any man's work shall be burned, these are covenant statements. This is the penalties of not having doing the right works. If your works get burned, why would they get burned? Because they're not of the Lord. It's a bunch of flesh stuff. It's a bunch of soul realm directed stuff. It's a bunch of what I, worldly ways or doing things contrary to the word. He's going to suffer loss. You're going to be damaged. It's the same word we saw over there. You're going to suffer loss. You're going to see, receive some sort of damage or injury in some capacity. Now, that's not talking about now, because remember, this is talking about the end of the days when you're trying to try. This is talking about in the life to come. It doesn't explain what damage or what loss you'll have, but in some aspect, you're going to have damage and loss if your works that you do in this life are burn up. It's going to affect you in the life to come. You won't, you won't, end, we won't end up in hell, because yet so as he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire, he'll make it through, you know. When it says he shall be saved, that is in the future tense, so that means it's going to happen. It's not conditional. It will happen in indicative mood, yet as by fire. But you and I don't want to go into eternity losing something, suffering damage, having loss in some capacity. We want to go into eternity having gained rewards and being blessed. These are covenant statements that affect you, not just now but in the life to come. Therefore, we better be doing the works of the Lord. We better be doing the things, and we can't keep compromise our, prin our principles, doing what the anything of the world in order to gain something. Must we must realize that, hey, you're going to be rewarded according to your works, one way or the other. And that's so important. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus said, because of your unbelief, I verily say it. Uh, is the reason, by the way, why they couldn't cast the demons out because of their unbelief. He said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, that's our part. You shall say into the mountain, that's also our part. You've got to speak words. Remove hence to yonder place. Otherwise, you've got to have faith through the word, and you act upon your faith by putting it in operation, speaking to the mountains in your life, the hindrances, and you command that to be removed, this is God's part. It shall remove. It shall be done. That's a guarantee. That's not, I hope it'll come to pass. No. That is an absolute guarantee of what God will bring to pass. Again, future, indicative mood, that's the mood of reality. This will absolutely happen. If you're not moving your mountains, then either one thing, either you're not in faith, or you're not speaking to the mountains. Don't put up with your mountains. God wants you to speak to your mountains. You don't put up with the devil. You speak to the enemy and get rid of him. You cast him out. You resist him. You don't let him continue to work against you in your life. That's why we don't put up with the devils in us. We're going to cast them out. 
We don't put up with the enemies trying to hinder us out there. We're going to speak to them and tell them to be removed. And God's going to remove them. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. God has given you authority. These are covenant statements. And when you realize this from a covenant standpoint, you're going to have faith, and you're also going to realize this is what God expects me to do, and I am going to do it. This is part of the works that I'm supposed to do. So don't, be, don't put up with the enemy working against you. You put your mouth in operation and work your faith and drive those enemies out and speak to those mountains till they're eliminated. Matthew 18, 1. Same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. He said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, this is in the, the a subjunctive mood, and become, this is also in the subjunctive mood, as little children, again, these are the conditions. These are conditions. Subjunctive mood. As we saw. You see it there. You shall not enter into, now this is interesting. This is not, this is actually is also in the subjunctive mood. Unless you become converted and as a little child, you may not, might not, in subjunctive mood, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Otherwise, there's other conditions on top of that. But if you don't even become converted and turn to him and become as a little child, no way you're going to enter in. But that doesn't mean, it's not a guarantee you're going to enter in. But those are conditions that you have to have because there's other conditions that you must meet in order to be able to enter into the rule and the reign of heaven. That's what's all in the subjunctive. He says, that Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, and again, this is another part of the condition, subjunctive mood, which you lose it when you just don't see it in the way they translate things in the modern versions. Young's brings it out may humble himself or might humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You want to be great? What do we need to do? We've got to be converted. We've got to become as little children. We're going to have to meet the conditions to enter in the kingdom. We're going to have to humble ourselves. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, doesn't he? That means God wants you to be humble before the Lord at all times, praise God, and do the things that he wants you to do. Over in uh, Matthew chapter 19, here's another covenant statement. Again, I say unto you that if, here's the if, two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. Now, what's the word ask? We already told you this is the word in the New Testament, Iteo, make a demand of what's due you. Otherwise, if someone comes up and says, hey, I want you to agree with me because I want to ask, I want to petition God for such and such. Sorry, I'm not going to agree with you. Because that's not the way you approach in the New Testament. Num number one, I can't pray that way. And if you want to pray that way, I'm not going to agree with you. It's not going to happen. Isn't, even if you prayed with somebody else you get to agree with, it's not going to happen if you're going to go asking, petitioning, and requesting because that's not the way you see the promises come to pass in the New Testament. Remember, we don't ask and request. We make a demand of what's due us and we have always approach them with thanksgiving as we take hold of the promise. This is a hard thing for many Christians to get, get out of because they're so used to, as what they've heard, is ask and ask and ask and ask. As long as you're asking with the attitude of requesting and petitioning, you're in the Old Testament era. You're not in the New Testament, and you're not bringing the Word of God to Him. Instead, we bring the Word to Him, and we take hold of it with thanksgiving. We thank Him as we take hold of the promise. That's the way you pray in the New Testament. We've talked about this. If two of you, shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall make a demand of what's due them. It shall be done for them. So what's our part? Our part is, if we got someone praying with you, be sure that they're praying with you according to the word and you're praying the scripture. They're not going to be doing, if you're praying the scripture and they're doing something else, you don't have an agreement. Because the word agree, actually is the word which symphonio, which is where we get our word symphony. What's a symphony? Symphonies where all the, vo the instruments are all making one sound. If something's out of sound, it doesn't make a symphony the same sound. It means you're to be in absolute agreement. So when you get someone to pray with you, be sure they're praying with you in agreement, right? Otherwise, you're wasting your time. It's not going to happen. You want to be sure that they agree with you regarding the things you're praying according to the Word of God. It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. That means it's a guaranteed done deal if you pray right. 
God says he'll do it. That's a covenant statement. He will absolutely bring these promises to pass in your life, praise God. We must do these things. Over in Matthew 21, in 21, if you have faith and doubt not, that's our responsibility, but there's more to it. You shall not only do that which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say to this mountain, that's our responsibility, and what are you supposed to do? Speak commanding words telling it what to do. Be thou removed. When it says be thou removed, this isn't asking it to go. No. You are making a commanding statement, imperative mood. You command this to be removed. If you're not, you've got yourself acclimated to commanding things to be removed, if you're asking God to remove it, you're wasting your breath. Now, it may be hard for some people, maybe haven't understood things. Quit asking God to remove things that he gave you authority over and told you to speak to it to be removed. Because where, where does authority operate? In the earth, through a person who has a physical body operating here. It doesn't operate from heaven as far as where this, it's coming through heaven, through, uh, from heaven through us, but it doesn't, op it doesn't operate independently from heaven without us putting it in operation. Therefore, you're the one that's going to say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast thee, you command it, and it shall be done. And then all things, whatsoever you shall I tell you, now again, you lose this a little bit with a shall, it's subjunctive. We keep on losing that, don't we? The subjunctive mood, which expresses things that are contrary to fact, conditional upon conditions being met. What's the condition? You are going to make the demand of what's due you in prayer. Believing you shall, there's something more you got to do here, you shall take hold of it. That's your responsibility, isn't it? You're the one that has to take hold of this. You shall take hold of it. And you're going to take hold of this in the future, and it's going to release the promise of God that will absolutely come to pass. That's your job. You're going to do that yourself. Again, these things are very important, that you and I are going to learn to pray as God would have us to pray. Very interesting. Also, it goes right along with this in Mark chapter 11, in verse 23. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, again, you're going to say, and this again is Whosoever shall say, this is the one who has the responsibility and it's subjunctive dependent upon you opening your mouth and doing something. And what do you say? Commanding words, be thou removed, be thou cast to see, shall not doubt in his heart. Again, that's our job. We cannot doubt in our heart. That's our responsibility. Subjunctive mood again, our responsibility. But shall believe that those things which he says, the word says, is the present tense, the things he's saying and continuing to say. And what are we saying? Mountain, be removed, and I cast you out. I cast you out, out of the way. And I continually say it because it's present tense. The things which he saith shall come to pass, or this means, better way of saying this is not that it, quote, shall come to pass. That's really not a good translation. Because it's in the present tense. I put the cursor over the word come to pass. It's a verb. Notice it says shall. It sounds like in the future it's going to come to pass. But that's not what it's saying. It's in the present tense. Which means, what's it saying? You believe that those things which you are saying are coming to pass. Present tense. Not that it shall come to pass. Are you with me? are coming to pass. Otherwise, you've got to believe that what you are saying, it's, put in oper it's going into operation and things are happening in the realm of the Spirit. I'm saying to this mountain, you be removed and you be cast in the sea and I don't doubt in my heart. I believe that those things which I am saying, for that thing to continually be removed, it, and I know and I believe that it is coming to pass. It is. These things are coming to pass. They're working right now. You can't say, well, I hope it'll happen in the future. See, this is really, you hold, lose the whole thing because shall sounds like, oh, it'll happen sometime in the future. That does not what it says. It is coming to pass. 
he shall have whatsoever he saith. That's where the shall comes in. You'll have it. Therefore, when you speak to the mountain, and you continue to speak to it, you, but also the condition is you believe and you know that what you are saying is happening. It is occurring. It is coming to pass. Not that, well, I hope it will. No, you're not in line with the covenant. It is coming to pass. That shows faith. That means you know that when you speak, God's going in operation. That's covenant. We know God, we're putting them in the work. We know what God's doing because we know God's performing our word. That we're speaking in line with his word. That's powerful. You get yourself to that place in line with the word. And you say, everything I'm saying to these mountains, it is working. Don't ever think, well, I hope it will work or maybe it will work. Or I know it shall work. You're not in line with it. It won't work then. We've got to come in line exactly with it. See, all these things are so important. These are covenant statements. You're putting it in operation, and also this shows you have faith. You know it's working right now. Praise God. And what's going to happen? You're going to have whatsoever you say. Covenant statements. We're going to talk more on this tonight because we've got a lot to talk about through the New Testament. We've covered quite extensively here, almost through most, most of in Matthew. But we've got more to cover, and then we'll be going into other parts of the New Testament. This is very important for you to understand because now, as you understand this is covenant, this should give you a total different perspective of the Word of God than maybe you've had in the past. It's not just like taking a scripture and doing it and all, oh, just gonna, you know, or whatever. No, it's performing covenant uh, responsibilities and do, knowing that God is performing His covenant responsibilities, which is bringing the promises into being. <clears throat> and all the things that are His responsibilities are all the promises that belong to you. Some say, I want, all the pro I want to know all the promises. Everything he tells you to do is your responsibility. Everything he says he'll do, that's all the promises that he'll bring to pass. And he'll do it. You can't just take hold of the promise without meeting the responsibility. That's what many people try to do. I'm just going to grab hold of the promise. I'm just claiming the promise. A lot of people are teaching that out there, aren't they? Claim the promise. Wait a minute. What's the conditions for the promise? I didn't know there was any conditions. I thought I could just take hold of my promise. Uh-uh. You meet the conditions, then the promise will come to pass. Amen. Hallelujah. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the revelation of covenant. I understand when the word says, if you do such and such, then I will perform that. That is covenant. I'm going to do my covenant responsibilities. I'm going to do the word, and then I know that God will perform his word. I understand from the subjunctive mood that things are conditional upon conditions being met. I will meet my conditions, and God will perform his word. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to do the word of God, speak the word of God, walk in the word of God, understanding covenant relationship and I'm going to put the word into operation in obedience to the covenant performing my responsibilities and I know what God will perform he will do his word and he will bring it to pass in every area of my life thank you Lord for the revelation of covenant responsibilities in my life in Jesus name Amen. We're going to pick up here tonight. We've got a lot to talk about as we're going to go through this. We're taking our time going through this because it is so important for you to understand covenant and also see the word from this covenant perspective. It's going to build your faith. You're going to be knowing, you know exactly what God will do. And see, when you're in faith, God's looking for faith. Remember when Jesus comes back, he says, is he going to find faith on the earth? He's looking for faith. If he can't find faith, he can't function. Because faith is what moves him. He, uh, faith shows you're doing the word. Praise God. Now you're going to be in faith. You're never going to do things from perspective of, well, I'll try this. We don't try anything. We do the word. If you have an attitude, well, I'm going to try this and see if it works. You don't understand covenant. You don't understand your responsibilities. You don't understand the promise. You don't understand God. God has made a covenant. 
and he will perform his word when we meet our responsibilities. Father, thank you for the revelation of covenant. Thank you there will be much fruit. We'll be hearers and doers of your word. Thank you for all that you're going to accomplish as we see the covenant promises come to pass in our life. There's much fruit from this message that we hear and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Tonight, we'll be talking more about this. We can make it in the 630 service. Before we close, and we'll be answering a question in a moment, anybody that has, does have any needs in prayer, we want to pray for you. First of all, let's say this. If any person is not born again, the most important decision in your life is to receive Jesus, your personal Lord and Savior, and be born again. That's the most important thing. If you've never received the Holy Spirit since you've believed, God wants you to receive the Holy Spirit. He hadn't come into you until you receive Him. If you haven't had you got your prayer language of praying in tongues, He wants everybody to be able to pray in tongues. It's a prayer language that every one of us have that we are most expected to pray in in order to pray as we must. He said, I'll pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with the understanding. That it wasn't nice little options. Well, I like this, but I don't want that. No, that's covenant statement. You pray in the Spirit, and you pray with your understanding. If you won't pray in the Spirit, praying in tongues, you're denying covenant in that area instead of fulfilling it. See, we've got to think of it from that perspective. So you want to get your prayer language. Also, if you need healing or you need deliverance, I'd like to minister to you, pray for you, minister to the needs or make appointments with you. And we'll be closing in a moment. I invite you to come forward if we close, but first we want to answer any questions. You have a question.